Well, that sucked. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb with a maybe controversial political opinion, but pandemics suck balls. That's that was not fun. Uh, it's technically still going on now. I shouldn't jinx it by saying acting like it's over. A lot of people are still having issues. Obviously, this is going to be something that takes all year to really get all the way through. But things are opening up a little bit. State parks are open. National parks are starting to open again. Um, but yeah, it's we're coming out of it. I think the biggest thing is just how well people have handled it. For the most part, everybody's taking care of each other and it's been really great. So I got, I got high hopes, but I had to get out. I canceled so many trips this spring. This was the prime time for going down to Southern Utah. I was planning on going to explore the ancestral Puebloan ruins south of Canyonlands. I was going to finally complete that trip all the way from the north end to the south end of San Rafael Swell. So for now, um, even though the national parks are opening up, I'm not going to them. I think I'm going to kind of take the year off of going to big places like that. I know there's a lot of people that now that things are reopening, they want to go have their once in a lifetime trip and that's fine. More power to them. I'm going to stay home or not stay home, but at least stay away from the parks and let them have that to themselves and be one less person there to, you know, kind of help the crowd stay down. I think this is a good year to explore places that don't get a lot of visitors, don't get as much tourist stuff, so that's my goal this year. And to start that off, I am going today to Fremont Indian State Park, which I've driven past many times, but I've never actually stopped and seen. I drove through it once, it's like a road, there's just petroglyphs everywhere, so I want to explore that. But this area is really nice. There's really pretty stuff around here. Beautiful mountains. The area, the Tusha Mountains down to the south are some of the tallest in Utah. It's just a network of ATV off-road trails. And there's all kinds of interesting stuff. If you look over my shoulder here, that's actually the western terminus of I-70. So I've always wanted to do a road trip where I start here and end in Baltimore, Maryland. And you hit the entire Midwest, you know, Ohio, Iowa, all of those places along the way are part of that freeway that starts right there. Also, the this terrain is actually a lot more interesting than it looks like. There's kind of a, a cone-shaped mountain over there. Um, looks kind of like a volcano. That's because it is a volcano. This whole area is volcanically active. Right over your shoulder over there is a collapsed caldera, kind of like Yellowstone. And so this whole area is geothermally... Geo geothermally active. This road that I'm next to goes off to Sulphurdale, which is an old, used to be an old mining town where they mined sulfur. And that's kind of a ghost town now. And they've, a geothermal power plant has sprung up in its place. That volcano over there erupted about 300,000 years ago. It's not, it's not going to happen anytime soon. But north of here are volcanic flows that would have flowed out when the Native Americans were in the area. So it's still pretty active. And like I say, the, the heat in the earth is not very uh, not very deep, so they're, they're doing all the power generation at that plant, which I think is pretty cool. But it's a cool area. I don't know what we're gonna see um, because we're still in kind of a virus time period. I don't wanna do anything crazy where I'm at risk and I might end up stranded in emergency services needs to spare time to rescue me. I don't want to hike on any cliffs where I'll fall down and end up in an ER. So it makes it an easy access vacation, but so many people need that. There's a lot of people that can't do these massive hikes or climb rocks or go forward. And this is it's easy to get to place. And I'm sure it'll be a lot of beauty shots of petroglyphs and maybe we'll go driving up in the mountains and we'll see some pine trees or something. Like I say, I've always wanted to explore these mountains and I've never done it, so now's the chance. Everybody's starting to get excited and head back to the national parks and I'm going to avoid them. We're going to find out what this place in the middle of nowhere, middle of nowhere is like. But let's go see what we can find. One thing that I noticed coming out of Sulphurdale was this uh, drainage. And it's kind of caught a, killed a big dead zone to the south. You can see how it's just uh, wiped out one area. 
It's a lot more a lot more easily visible from a satellite map. Thing is, I looked on uh, previous maps. This dead zone predates the power plant that's up there, so I don't blame that geothermal plant for all this. I think this is just the byproduct of that sulfur mining in the 1900s. They dug down, now there's water coming up. Maybe this happened in the 80s or something where it kind of got came to a head. Um, just it's, it's left over from mining, kind of sucks, but it's part of our history in a sad way. Decide if I want the tent or the tent trailer. Camp is set up. The foil dinner is cooking. Get some water going for some rice later. Let's see what we can see. I chose this campsite because there's nobody to the, I was going to say north of me, I think it's south, but up canyon there's nobody for a long ways. On the other end of me I got uh, Mr. TP over there, but this whole area is all mine. Castle Rock Campground got its name from the interesting rock spires surrounding the campground. Prehistorically, the area was a canyon that filled with sediment from the eroded Joe Lot Tuff volcanic layer. After the canyon filled with layers of sediment, they eroded back down into the spires today. The entire area is accessible behind the campsites. There aren't any trails, just watch where you go to minimize impact, stay safe, and try not to interrupt any of the other campers. Yeah, this will be nice. bad in the other direction either. The towers are the eroded sediment. The white mountain behind is the original volcanic layer. It's like walking into a giant natural cathedral. Whenever I first come to a campsite, I spend the first night just kind of Settling in, scouting the area, walking around, kind of get settled in, make it feel like it's my own. Tomorrow we'll start up with all the real photography and videography and all that. Beautiful. This is another good thing about having Dutch oven dinners or foil dinners. You can wander around a little bit while it cooks. Explore the campground. Ooh, Venus is bright today. Do you see that? That's a bat. Oh, where is it? There it is. We think a desert's as desolate, but if you look around, there's a lot of life around you. In spring, you might see a lot of these webs in the trees and bushes. And while it first thought it might be like a whole bunch of spiders, if you look on crawling on there, they're actually uh, tent caterpillars that'll grow up to be moths. Now, there's not a whole lot of caterpillars in this one but it's because it's finally warmed up for the day and if you look, they've all migrated off and now they're going and getting lunch down in the leaves. What they'll do is they'll come down here, eat during the day, and then go back up into their tent during the night to stay warm. Now they'll live as one big group.
Growing up, my parents were more of the flower identifiers than I was, but from looking at a book, I think this is a Stansberry's Phlox. There were gorgeous clumps of them all over the campground area. Beautiful view from Five Finger Ridge. This is headed eastbound on I-70. This cliff here is all Fremont Indian State Park. You can see some of the, the canyons that go up into the hills. All the petroglyphs along here. And then out there in the distance, that's Clear Creek Canyon, or the, the rest of Clear Creek Canyon. I-70 doesn't go through it, it's a little too narrow and windy, so I-70 slices through the mountains to the left. This is Five Finger Ridge. It was steep but short to get up to the top here, but the creek didn't originally go through there. That and I-70 was all put in in the 70s or 80s? I think it was the late 70s. Basically, this ridge continued onward, and the creek went really close to the cliffs over there. And up on this ridge, right where I'm standing, it continued out a little ways, and this is the top of one of the largest Fremont settlements that have ever been discovered. And then down in the area below is where they would do all their farming and agriculture. They said that the, the village up here was so large it forced them to rethink how big Fremont villages were. Unfortunately, because they had to put I-70 through, after they did all the archaeological digs and recovered what they could, they literally eliminate about two-thirds of this hill. So the village was right there, which has now been dug out. It's also pretty impressive to give you an idea how much they uh, dig out just to create a right-of-way for the freeways. Driving I-70 through here, you can see just how much of the entire area was basically re-sculpted, tearing out hills, mountains, and valleys to smooth the ride of the freeway, especially coming down the canyon over there from Cove Fort. This canyon has evidence of native human habitation and carving from 3,700 BC all the way up to the introduction of the railroad. Since the Fremont people who made most of them left before even modern Hopi and Paiute tribes occupied the area, even official descriptions of the meaning of the rock art is mostly conjecture or educated guesses. Nobody truly knows the meanings. Unfortunately, this panel is riddled with bullet holes, but if you look, there's some really large and really good animals carved in. It's not often that you see a elk or deer whatever one that one is, in the uh, old petroglyphs. I think that this was probably a very rich hunting area and so they documented what was found by continuing up into the mountains, up the canyon. I'm not sure how old the uh, bullet holes are. It's really a shame. Hopefully they're old and Pioneers and prospectors did it, and that wasn't anything recent from people doing that. Although some of those holes are massive. Those are dinner plate sized chunks. Given an idea of the size, it's hard to describe, but let's say the body of this solid guy right here is about six inches tall at the middle. The tall end there is maybe nine, ten inches almost. So all these figures are about a foot tall. What you find at this place is amazing. I'm looking for the drought panel and I haven't found it yet but there's this swirly here. They said it was right next to a rock fall. So there's a big rock fall. It's not here but when I was looking here there's a lot of pictographs. We got some zigzags. Looks like some type of a humanoid, maybe a warrior. Don't know what these guys are under the zigzag here, but we've got a couple guys right there. There's the drought panel. It's on the other side of the rock fall. So this one is said to depict the drought that came 
around 1200 AD. There's a guy praying to the symbol for rain. Up here we've got the fields of corn are the dots that never sprouted. And it says that this uh, symbol at the bottom, the square, is supposed to be a map to what's on the other side of Clear Creek right there. They say that the symbols correspond to the top here and the wavy line is the path up to a watering hole maybe up in this little cave at the very top and that that's where they went to make offerings for the rain but it never came and that's why the deity has his hands in his ears because he didn't listen at least I think that's the deity see that that or that is don't know one of these guys it also says that there was more to the panel, but it sheared off with the, uh, the rock fall. The rock fall was caused during the blasting for I-70, so it's pretty recent. Whatever remains of the panel is now face down below me. I don't know if I've emphasized as much how much rock art is along this state park's wall, but like just all along the road, the whole cliffside is covered. This isn't even like a marked location with a on a guide or anything. This is just everywhere. This is the one they excavated and found about seven feet down and under the ground here. They found habitation back down to 3,700 BC. Kind of in the reflection there, see that there's a petroglyph up on the... Actually, you can probably see it yourself. Let's see. They say that maybe that that's a scene of sheep in the area that they were hunting. Not easy to do. Also, up along the top, there's a you can see there's a line etched. It goes end to end within here. Crazy. Above that sheep is a line with two notches in it. Uh, that's thought to be an atlatl. Atlatl. That uh, you know, just after it's been thrown, that's what it looks like without the launcher. The guide says you may go in, but no more than three people on the roof at a time. So let's check this out. Please not be any snakes. Oh, tiny. I'm gonna get my fat ass in. Not a lot of room, obviously. It's nice and cool in here, though. Just like they said in the diagram. Heading out to the Hundred Hands Cave. Parallels the freeway, so... A little bit of road noise, but... It's great just seeing the... Rock of the canyon. It's a beautiful canyon. There we go. There's to keep people out, but you're narrow enough you can get in there. I don't think there's a hundred hands. There's not a lot. 